Welcome back. So today we're going to be taking a look at the exposure triangle in photography. Now, whether you're learning how to shoot on manual, an automatic or a semi-automatic mode, it doesn't really matter. Understanding how the exposure triangle and the three different aspects used inside of the camera to regulate your exposure as well as other functions is important. Look, the camera doesn't know what you're photographing. There are some modes called scene modes. On scene modes, you can specify whether you're photographing macro, a portrait, action, or anything like that. It helps the camera identify what you're trying to do. But the best thing you can do for yourself in photography is learn this. I know in today's world, not everybody has the time to sit down and learn this information. But if you're really interested in photography, understanding this exposure triangle is going to be key to your success. The truth is most photographers actually shoot in manual. And the reason we shoot in manual is because of control of the camera. It's not an exposure thing. Getting the exposure at this point is really pretty easy for me. I don't really have to think much about it. Now there are occasions where your light gets bright and dark, bright and dark. Just imagine you're outside and the clouds keep passing in front of the sun. At one point it's sunny, then it's dark. And you don't always know when that's gonna happen. So there are reasons or times in which you can use a semi-automatic mode, but you have to be able to set your camera in a working parameter so you can achieve what you want when you're taking photographs. So let's take a look at this exposure triangle. Now there's little icons. This is made, you would think, for a kindergarten class. The idea here is to make this simple as possible for somebody to understand. The camera has three main different functions. The first thing that we have is ISO. Now ISO controls what we used to call as film speed. So if you remembered 100 speed film or 400 speed film, actually that used to be written as ASA, not ISO. Today, since we have digital cameras, the ISO is really referring to the sensor and it's controlling the sensitivity of the sensor. At 100 speed film, your sensor is less sensitive. And this is a little bit confusing to people. And at 3200, this is more sensitive. And really this is done by gain, but we're not gonna get into the technical aspects. This is ISO. ISO is probably the least important of the three main functions as far as controlling your image. Now, every function on the camera does two different things. One is control the amount of light in the camera. The secondary function that it has is it affects your image in some way. That some way is noise. Now, 100 speed film, you can see here, this is gonna give you the best quality image. And as you move up the scale, you're going to add noise to your image. This doesn't mean that at 3200, it's gonna be this noisy. This is an exaggeration of the fact. It really depends on the camera and the sensor and the lens that you're shooting with as to how much noise you're gonna get in your image. The truth is most cameras today can easily shoot up to 3200 ISO and not have a lot of noise. And we're gonna see a little bit of noise here in these images, but truthfully, you probably wouldn't recognize noise until you get up to it, at least 1600 in modern cameras. So let's look at ISO again. When you're at 100, that's gonna be for a sunny day. And when you're at 3200 or 1600, that's when it's gonna be dark or you're inside. And the reason is because you don't have as much light. So as you have less light, you need to raise your ISO. As you have more light, it allows you to shoot at a lower ISO. In turn, that's gonna give you less noise. You can see up here in this triangle, notice that all the arrows are pointing this way. And what that's in reference to is you move this way on the scale, your photo or your exposure is gonna become brighter. What does that mean? So let's take a look at exposure really quick before we get into these other two images. 
in this image, we have three different versions of the same photo. This is what we would conclude as the correct exposure. The one to the left is overexposed, meaning there's too much light. And the one to the right is gonna be underexposed because there's not enough light in the exposure. So when I refer to exposure, this is what we're talking about. Over and under exposure. Over is too much, under is not enough light. The next thing we have is shutter speed. And shutter speed controls motion in a camera as well as light. Remember, every function on the camera controls two aspects and one is always how much light enters the camera. Shutter speed controls the shutter inside of the camera. Now, we have two main types of cameras. We're gonna have the DSLR and we're gonna have a mirrorless camera. In a DSLR, you're gonna have the addition of a mirror. That mirror is going to pop up when you press the shutter release button. And then behind that, you're gonna have a curtain. That curtain is referred to as the shutter. It's gonna open and close depending on what number you set it to. If you have a slow shutter, it's gonna open up for a long time. And if you have a fast shutter, it's gonna open up for a quick time. And it's gonna let less light into the camera. Now on a mirrorless camera, we are eliminating that mirror and you're gonna have a mechanical shutter. Now you can use what's called an electronic shutter, but we're gonna skip that for right now because it's gonna make it too complicated. But it does have that same curtain. That curtain is going to open and close depending on the number that you have it set at. So a fast number, it's gonna open and close quickly. And these numbers here are referring to a fraction of a second. So this is actually 1 15th of a second, a 30th of a second, a 60th of a second, and a thousandth of a second. So this is in fraction, but we just write it as 15, 30, 60, 125. And these are how the numbers go in your camera. When we're looking at numbers or explaining or talking about aspects of a camera, we use a system of what we call whole stops. Now cameras actually go in third of stops, but when trying to explain the functions in photography, you use whole stops, so it makes a lot more sense and it's easier to explain. So in this case, if we were to say 60 is a whole stop, there's actually two numbers in between 30 and 60, that would be 50 and 40, and then you would come to 30. And the reason for that is digital cameras are very sensitive, and if we went by whole stops only, it would be difficult to get the exposure exact. And in this case, we need to go in third stops so we can make more of a finite adjustment. So in shutter speed, and the numbers go this way and this way, and most cameras go from about 30 seconds up to one eight thousandth of a second. But for the sake of a tutorial and having to not put eight million numbers up here, this is how we're gonna write this. So we have 15, 30th, 60, 125, 250, 500, 1000. So you can see right here as you go up in your number, so the shutter is opening and closing really fast so it's letting less light in. And as we move down the scale, we're getting more light because the shutter is opening and closing much slower. So we're letting more light come in. Now the secondary function of the shutter is it is controlling motion. And we have two different icons here, and there's a good reason for that. You will notice that we have the number 60 and 500 in red. So why is that? So let's start at 60th. So a 60th is the slowest shutter speed you should have to take a picture of a non-moving subject when you're holding the camera. Does this mean that you can't do it at a 30th? No, but the chances are you're gonna get a little bit of motion blur. So it's a good idea to be at a 60th of a second or faster if you're trying to take a handheld picture with your camera. As you go down, if you don't want blur and your subject isn't moving, that's when you would use a tripod. Now, there's different ways to say this. We're just gonna use this general term for today. If you've heard this number really depends on the focal length of your camera that is another way to think about it but to make things simple we're just going to use a 60th of a second 
So remember, this is minimum. If you can shoot at 125th of a second, you're gonna be better off. So this doesn't mean, because this image is blurred, that you can't shoot a non-moving subject faster. Now up here we have 500th of a second. And the reason we have 500th of a second is because that is the minimum shutter speed to stop action. Now in this case, it's very slow action, like a, a walk or a jog, not sport action. If you were trying to stop football, basketball, or soccer, you would have a difficult time getting all your images to be tack sharp. You'd see a little bit of motion blur, as you can see in this image. If you're trying to stop fast action. Now, if you're just trying to stop slow action, more than likely this is gonna work. And as you go lower in shutter speeds, that action is going to blur more and more. Now, it's not saying that blur is bad. There's actually cases when you can actually blur an image and make it look good. We're just trying to explain the basics of how a camera works. So the minimum is 500 to stop action. If you're trying to take a handheld picture of a non-moving subject, like a portrait as we see in this image, you wanna be at a 60th of a second or faster. Now, if you're trying to take a picture of action photography, a thousand is about the minimum that you really wanna get. 2000 is gonna be better and then higher. Now, most cameras only go up to about an 8,000th of a second as their fastest shutter speed. So you can see right here, this is good for action. This is good for blur. So let's take a look really quick at the difference between what we mean by blur and action. All right, so in our first image here, we have a mountain biker flying off a jump. And you can see not only are the wheels perfectly sharp, but he is perfectly sharp. So in this case, we're using a fast shutter speed to stop that action. Next image, we have this picture of this dog running. And as you can see, the little dog is in the air, his little mouth is open and tongue is out. We're using, once again, a fast shutter speed to stop the action. And in this case, it's probably a really fast shutter speed, so at least two thousandths of a second. In this next image of the skateboarder here, this is a good example of using motion. It's difficult to get the aspect of time in an image. Now the photographer might have shot this at around a 500th of a second, even though it's fast action. And the intent here could have been to kind of get a little bit of motion blur so it looks like there's movement in the photo when there really isn't. You'll notice he is sharp, but not perfectly tack sharp. So here's a good example of what blur would look like in an image. And in this case, the photographer actually used the blur on purpose to give this sort of dreamy movement in the water that we see here. We're shooting at a slow shutter speed, meaning like a 1 15th or a 30th of a second. And as the water rushes in, and because you can't hold the camera still, it's actually blurring in the camera to give you this feel. Now this could be a mistake or something that someone did on purpose. Now here's another good example of using blur in your image. So you're using a long exposure, like a one or a two or a three second exposure to get this effect with the water. But if you look at the stones, they're perfectly sharp. So how was this done? This was done using a tripod. Since your camera isn't moving and the only aspect that's moving in the image is the water, you, you get that dreamy glowing effect as the water rushes across the rocks. Well, let's go ahead and review shutter speed here. A 15th of a second is a slow shutter speed, and that's gonna let more light in the camera, but possibly cause blur. A fast shutter speed is gonna let less light in, and it's gonna be used to stop action. And as you go this way on shutter speed, you're letting in more light. So the last thing that we have is aperture, and the aperture is dealing with the lens the opening and closing of the iris. This little thing that we see right here is a little diaphragm and it's referred to as the iris, just like the eye in your eye. It opens and closes. So in this case, it's closed down. In this case, it's wide open. When it's wide open, it's gonna let more light in and when it's closed down, it's gonna let less light in. This process is called the aperture.
and the numbers are written as F stop. Sometimes you're gonna see the F 2.8, but in a lot of cases, you're just gonna see 2.8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11. It doesn't make a difference. You don't have to say F 5.6, but that's originally how this was written. Now the confusing aspect of this is that the small number refers to the large opening and the large number refers to the small opening. And this is where a lot of people get confused in photography. Now, as we've learned before, every aspect of the camera has two functions. One, it's controlling the amount of light. So at F22, it's letting in less light. As we can see here, and as we go down this way, and get to F2.8, it's letting in more light. It also controls what we call depth of field. So in this image, if you imagine that we focused on this person meditating right here, and then we have mountains in the background. So how much before and behind the subject is in focus? That's the depth of the field. If you're at F22, you're gonna have what we refer to as a wide depth of field, meaning that your subject in the mountain, everything is gonna be in focus. As you go down the scale this way, where you're letting in more light, you have less depth of field, or what we call a shallow depth of field. So only the subject or the person in focus is gonna be sharp, and the background is gonna be blurry. In photography, aperture is one aspect of how you control depth of field. Up here you'll notice I have numbers are the opposite of logic, so that's what this is referring to, meaning that 22 is the small opening, and 2.8 is the large opening. Depth of field is also affected by focal length and distance to the subject. We'll get into that in a later video, but I think it should be noted that depth of field is a combination of aperture, focal length, and distance to subject. So once again, aperture is referring to the iris opening and closing in your camera. A large aperture, F2.8 lets a lot of light in and has a shallow depth of field. F22 is a small aperture, meaning the iris is closed down, but it has a large or a wide depth of field. Well, that's a little bit about the three different aspects of the exposure triangle and what they do inside of our camera. So the next thing that we're gonna be taking a look at in the next video is how to meter and how these different aspects work together to get the correct exposure and to take the type of image that you would like to see.